I have a rant to share with y'all. As a physician, as a wife, as a mom, as a uh, patient, we are all patients at the end of the day. Some of us are doctors and nurses and are healthcare professionals, but we're all, at the end of the day, patients. 100% of us, right? That unites us. That's why COVID is so powerful. It's brought the global community together. One virus is showing us that we're all one. So we gotta act as one. I've been thinking about this and contemplating this for a very long time. My good friends, close friends all know this. Physicians and frontliners have gone through a very difficult time in the past 15 years. 20 years ago, the situation was different. We didn't have as many administrators. Over a timeline of 20 years, from like 1995 to 2009, the number of physicians, there's a graph that, you know, later on I'll post or I'll post below. The number of physicians over time has not really increased. The number of administrators has increased by 3,500% if there is such a thing. That's monumental. At the same time, in 2015, the healthcare industry became the number one industry in America over retail, 2015. $3 trillion. 73% of the $3.3 trillion is spent on administrators, pharmaceutical companies, and insurance companies and their administrators. If you haven't watched Dirty Money, it's a documentary on Netflix, it's free, check it out. It really sheds light of why we are in the situation that we are in, in the healthcare industry today. Today, we're having shortages of personal protective equipment for frontline physicians, nurses, medical assistants, APPs, you name it. We have a shortage nationally. We have a shortage of ventilators, you name it. And doctors and APPs, nurses and so forth, they are all putting their lives on the line for their patients. We've always done this. We've always done this. Altruism has always been the number one reason you go into medicine or a healthcare profession, it is not the money. It was maybe 25 years ago, but my friends, let me tell you my own situation. How about that? I'm a hospitalist. I love my job. I love the people that I work with. They're awesome. My institution is awesome. They actually listen to what I have to say. We've made leaps and bounds difference in our documentation. I'm the documentation person because I knew that would be the biggest bang for the buck for our physician wellness efforts. And so I married the two, that's physician wellness and frontliner wellness is really my uh, passion because it affects patient care directly, directly. They are intertwined together. So right now we're decreasing the burden on documentation for our physicians at UNM. We are decreasing the number of queries. I have an entire team working on this and they're all responsive and the executives are also responsive. So kudos to all the people that are listening. Thank you. But I am in $460,000 worth of debt at 6% from student loans. Because you know what? I've been schooled for 15 years. 15 years more than the average person. So has my husband. He's also a physician hospitalist at the VA. Um, we have to have a home. We have a 12-year-old. I'm pregnant. We got to have a plan for their education, for our baby's education, both of them. Uh, we pay a mortgage. We pay all kinds of bills. I get paid about $200,000 a year, which is not even at the 25th percentile of the AMC. That's another situation. 
it is what it is, right? But here's the issue. The discrepancy with the amount of loans that I'm under and how much I pay monthly for those, how much I pay for my my daughter's tuition, how, and how much I make is paycheck to paycheck. It's an atrocity. And I'm just giving you an N of one. This is an issue nationally that we face as physicians nationally. Every single physician that is young, you know, has been in, in the field for the, you know, in the past 10 years or so. And the ones that are graduating now and, and so forth. Average physician comes out with somewhat like three hundred thousand to three hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of debt in student loans what job can you find nowadays that will offset that and will pay for it i don't even know you know the 10-year forgiveness plan may or may not happen because the government some days they're like oh let's do this some days they're like oh let's not they just play with you it's a scam you keep calling 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 every single person gives you a different answer about a different thing so let me tell you that we're not in it for the money. Majority of doctors have a side hustle because they cannot afford one job. Can you believe that? To make ends meet for their families. 90% of doctors nowadays are telling their children, including our family, 90% of doctors do not allow their children to go into a field of medicine. And both me and my husband, both physicians, are in that boat. Our children are not allowed to go into medicine. It is the most discompassionate, abusive, and honestly, unethical field that you can go into. You go in with compassion, and the system, the system that you work under is not compassionate. It's all about numbers and productivity and, and about... Oh, how much money and how much money are you making for the system? And, you know, we're not going to give you a raise. Of course not. But just churn out the patients because we're paying the insurance companies. We're paying the pharmaceutical companies. They are making so much money off the sacred relationship of the doctor and patient. Richard Branson says, it's not clients that come first. It is the employees that come first. If you take care of your employees, they will take care of your clients. I've thought about that for years now. I mean, obviously, Richard Branson is a very successful man and he treats his people right. We don't do that in medicine. Mm -mm. Healthcare is the opposite. It's as if like the more brutal you are with your staff, with these super intelligent humans, right? Doctors are some of the most intelligent humans that exist and they've worked so hard. They're not only intelligent, but they have the motivation and the compassion and the healing that you need as a patient. And yet, that is exactly the group that we do not give compassion to as a system. We keep barraging them and we keep putting them putting more and more burden on them to churn out more patients. And it, it's mind boggling. We can't treat patients right if we are not treated right. This is the time to make a demand to change our healthcare system. A hundred percent of us are patients. A percentages of us or healthcare professionals, but we're all patients. We gotta come together. We gotta come together, make it better for everybody. If we make it better for the doctors, we make it better for the nurses, we make it better for the APPs, we make it better for so on and so forth. We make it better for the patients. How is it that right now, a patient that goes into the hospital and we're telling them to go get your COVID rule out, right? $10,000 is their bill ten thousand dollars to go visit the in the ed to get the test done and to see if you have the infection or not how is that not a deterrent for going into the hospital and getting tested when you're actually ill how are we okay with this now this goes up 
when you're actually hospitalized. Let's say now you have a pneumonia from the COVID and you gotta be watched. Um, average bill, $34,000, $34,000, Are we okay with that? You know how much the doctor gets paid out of that? Like, I don't know, like $23. And I'm being a little facetious, but no, I'm not off that much. We don't get paid majority of that money. 73% of the $3.3 trillion that is made in the healthcare industry is taken by the administrators and is taken by insurance and pharmaceutical companies and their administrators. So we keep saying there's no money. There's no money to give free healthcare or take care of our physicians or or increase your raise or actually incentivize you to do extra work or you know our APPs a lot of them are working extra hours for free what they are putting their lives and the lives and the health of their families on the line my husband is on the COVID team at the VA as we speak he goes in with a set of scrubs before he comes home he takes a shower, changes out of all of that, comes home, takes another shower and changes out of all of those clothes, leaves his shoes outside the door, and that's how we're living our lives. And he comes in like, what has happened? What has happened to my life throughout the day? Because the energy is absolutely crazy at the hospital. It always is. Nobody is at the hospital at their best. Nobody nobody no patient goes to the hospital and is hospitalized because they're feeling great and it's like it's a sunny day woohoo let's have fun no everybody's at the hospital because they're really 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 sick and they cannot really live at home anymore at that point they need medical care every single day so as you can imagine the patient is at their worst their families and loved ones are at their worst so the energy is already like tough to deal with, right? And then you add on this pandemic that is scaring everybody out of their socks, right? Everybody thinks about the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, which took 40% mortality rate. Thankfully, the COVID-19 infection is not that bad. It's 1.3% as of yet in the US. But let me tell you, it's going to keep getting worse you know especially for the elderly population for the sick population for the malnourished for the immune compromised and so on and so forth so we need our frontliners to be well taken care of we need their mental health to be in the right place we need them to go outside and get fresh air we need them to eat right we need them to be hydrated but you know what when i'm working let me tell you what happens you forget about eating, you forget about hydrating, you forget about going to the restroom. Although right now being pregnant, you cannot forget about going to the restroom. Like every 10 minutes I gotta go. But you know, I'm, I'm gonna do that because I have taken an oath to take care of my patients. The only way I can see us coming out of this better than we did before because you know, hardships, build character right if you choose it to all eyes are on health care all eyes are on health care on physicians frontliners APPs nursing staff the whole gamut and patients we need to all come together and unite and have a united voice Francis aside Focus on this huge problem that has affected us for years and continues to affect us. And 400 physicians kill themselves every year, you guys. 400 physicians. Every physician on average sees about 3,000 patients per year, which means million patients a year that do not have access to a physician to take care of them in one year. This is going on for years now. There are doctors who are leaving the field, just trickling out, trickling out, trickling out. There's also, you know, we're telling people, we're like, dude, this field is not compassionate like you thought it was. 
It's not about your cognition. It's not as much about, it's all about, hey, throughput and writing notes and the burden that is put on us constantly by regulation. Let's decrease regulation. Yet Let's regulate the insurance companies and let's regulate the pharmaceutical companies and cap their price gouging when Plequinol goes from 35 cents a pop to $6 a pop during this pandemic, who's profiting? It's not you and I, it is not the patient, it is not the nurse, it's not the doctor, it's not the APP, it's the pharmaceutical companies. Price gouging, as we speak, where's that money going? In their pockets. Why isn't the government regulating that? We obviously have all the money to pour back into the frontliners and into the patient's lives so that they are not stuck with the $40,000 bill for a COVID infection that they should come into the hospital and get care for. Our priorities need to change and we need to reallocate this. If there's money to go around for all of us, y'all. Let's not be so greedy. There's $2.5 trillion that goes in the pocket of those who are not even taking care of patients. They're not at the bedside. Why? Why? We gotta come together and advocate to regulate that. Not every single movement that I make through the hospital to take care of sick humans. Think about it. I am ecstatic to hear your thoughts, your comments. If you feel strongly about this too, send me a message, send a comment video your own either frustration but also solution because we cannot move forward if we are just frustrated and we have been very frustrated and i've re read so many articles by so many physicians talking about all of this all the abuse for so long that it's gotten to a point we are at a peak and we need to come up with solutions my solution is regulation and reallocation of the money that goes, the 73%, right, into where it actually matters, into our frontliners, what they, their needs are, incentivize them to do a good job, give them the equipment, give them the personnel and staffing. We're understaffed constantly. Don't just do like the minimum that you can staffing like let's do as much staffing as we need incentivize people to do this work help patients with their medical bills it should never be that high it should literally just never be that high to get medical care anywhere anywhere so that's my solution would love to hear what your solutions are this is the time to advocate where well, we'll have time at home while you're sitting at home, hanging out with your friends, family, whatever. Talk about this stuff. Talk about the issues that really matter. Come up with solutions. Post them. Spread the word. Talk about it. I mean, nothing goes away unless you actually do something about it and not just complain about it, right? Let's do this together. We can.